Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Sears Institute. We're so glad to have you all here today. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you all uh, Dr. Al Sears. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the Sears Institute for Anti-Aging Medicine. So uh, today you're going to hear from Dr. Levitt about um, a, a new procedure where you can get a facelift effect without surgery using stem cells. Cool, uh, avant-garde, uh, leading-edge idea. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about putting that into perspective, about where we are with the state of anti-aging and how this new uh, technology of stem cells fits in and what we should be thinking about it. So, uh, anti-aging medicine, I want to talk to you a little bit about that because I've been in it for a while, and maybe there is something to be learned from that and transferred uh, to you all. Um, I actually have been in anti-aging medicine since its inception in this country. As a matter of fact, I preceded it by a little bit. Um, I started doing kind of uh, enhancement of sports performance way back when I was in my 20s as an athlete for a university. And I wasn't really that good of an athlete, but I was, I was good at enhancing uh, capability from how I got to, to have my, my strength and performance with my own body. So at that time in, um, the late 1970s, we didn't have most of the technology that we have now. For instance, nobody knew what stem cells were. We had not yet discovered telomerase in the telomere, which is the biggest uh, breakthrough in anti-aging of our generation. And we didn't know too much about, about hormones and uh, anti-aging uh, hormones and performance had been around in uh, back channels, uh, an, an inappropriate and illegal activity that athletes were pursuing at the time. Um, and that was about to change, uh, partly because of um, genetic engineering, which was a fledgling science at the time. Uh, we were getting growth hormone from cadavers. You could take uh, people who had donated their organs and dissect their pituitary gland and process growth hormone out of it. And that created a new era of athletics. Uh, many of you were around then and you saw what happened. Uh, the East German athletes and the Soviet bloc athletes started kicking butt around the world in the Olympics and the U.S. started trying to figure out how they were doing that. And now since we have a lot of rules about what you can and can't do, but back then none of that was there. So they were taking uh, testosterone, they were taking um, analogs of testosterone, and they were taking cadaver harvested growth hormone, and it produced the new field of, of bodybuilding you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, a new generation of 320 pound uh, unnatural behemoths with no body fat. Um, that's my entry point into performance enhancement with athletes. And what I was trying to do was to find more natural ways, more um, sustainable ways and less dangerous ways to do that with athletes. Along came medical school, and I decided to do rehabilitation. So we would take what I learned with athletes and apply it to people who were injured, people who were disabled, uh, spinal cord injuries, all of that stuff. And that had never been done. Lo and behold, it worked. It worked exceptionally well. To use those same kinds of things that athletes were using to get superior performance never seen before to an injured person, to a person with chronic uh, disability. It turns out if you give somebody, um, say, with um, HIV, which we didn't know how to treat with uh, you know, the, 
the antiviral drugs. Uh, if you give them testosterone and growth hormone, they grow back their, their muscle and lost organ tissue um, because you're accelerating that anabolic or building thing. So that was a, a tool that I used in rehab when I was during my, my third and fourth year of medical school where I could do my own research projects and in my first year of internship. This is where the story takes a turn because it turns out that was not what the medical school, the hospitals wanted me to be doing. Um, but it was my passion. It was what I always wanted to do to improve performance. So me and my residency mutually decided I would be better off somewhere else. <laughs> so I left that program and started my own practice of doing that, rehabilitation, uh, sports uh, performance, and regular uh, weekend athlete. We're gonna make you stronger, faster, more powerful. And that was in 1992. I also started to address the issue of loss of function, loss of muscle, loss of capacity with age as part of that performance enhancing uh, goal. And I had a practice, I called it uh, Salutology, the study of health. And I started a company called YouthQuest, which was about finding the attributes of youth and giving them back to people who had lost it. Um, it, it wasn't very successful. It was kind of like beating my head against the wall. Nobody knew what the hell I was talking about. And people would call about uh, YouthQuest thinking it was a, a kid's camp program or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, um, later um, the next year, in the fall of 93, I got a call from um, a doctor who I'd met at a conference one time his name was Dr. Ronald Klatz. And he said, we have a new radical idea. We want to start a new division of medicine, and we're going to call it anti-aging medicine. We've read some of your stuff. We would like to invite you to join us. So they had a meeting in 1992 where they kind of planned that, but then their first conference was in Cancun in 93. And I went there, and I provided my perspective of what I had been doing for performance enhancing. And it became a little piece of what became the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, which is the fastest growing branch of medicine and has 16,000 certified physicians around <coughs> the world now. Uh, so it's become big industry. Ronald Klatz and uh, Robert Goldman, who started it, uh, became my friends. Uh, I helped to write the, um, the exams for board certification. And, and then eventually we went our separate ways. They sold that uh, to a big education consortium and they are semi-retired uh, now. But here I am still doing it. And I tell you that story because that puts into perspective where I came from and what my goals were in dealing with anti-aging. And we're gonna use that to kind of put the stem cell revolution and, and regenerative medicine into perspective. So I've witnessed three big breakthroughs. And the first one is what I talked about with hormone replacement that it, um, it really developed uh, during my time uh, with athletes and in the early stages of anti-aging medicine. It became all the rage and you could go to an anti-aging doctor and everybody got growth hormone and sex steroids, testosterone for men, estrogen, progesterone for, for women. Um, and it became a successful subdivision of medicine. But of course, success uh, causes attention. And when it got the attention of organized medicine, they uh, wanted to own it. So the big drug companies got on board, started to produce synthetic uh, hormones, and that became the standard in conventional medicine. That's what happens is, at first, your radical idea is crazy and laughable, 
and then it's contestable. They need to argue you out of existence and maybe uh, fight you, try to take away your license, uh, call you before the state boards. Um, and then it becomes part of convention. And then in the last stage, uh, convention claims that they invented it uh, and they knew it all along with no memory of, of the persecution. <laughs> so it went that way, but then organized medicine, because they used uh, drugs to achieve their goals, ran into side effects. And some of you have probably heard of the Women's Health Initiative. It put a damper on that whole uh, science of replacement uh, for reduction of cardiovascular benefits. I'm here to tell you uh, hormone replacement is still viable, it's still important. It uh, is a double-edged sword and it, it requires care and knowledge, but the hormones are the primary executors of the aging program. They don't, they don't, um, they're not the brains, they're not the control center, but they are the delivery boys. Uh, once your, your body changes the aging signals that are occurring from transcription of DNA, it communicates that through hormones. So hormones are the executors of it, and for the most part, they decrease. Uh, insulin and cortisol increases with age, and a good anti-aging program uh, hopes to modify those. Uh, you see we have a big um, uh, push towards syndrome zero, and that's about the overproduction of insulin in the modern world worsened by age. Uh, cortisol, stress hormone, big problem as we age. All of the rest of these guys on that list, they all go down. So augmenting those or supporting those are helpful in managing the consequences of aging. Uh, still important, and and all of us should uh, at least consider measuring those, finding out where we are and what might be done. In early 1990, I read an article uh, that discovered kind of the, the basic mechanism for aging that was in Science Magazine. It didn't get converted into, into medicine and is still not. Uh, it's, it's in the anti-aging community uh, peripherally, but it's still not a major focus. Amazingly so. It's as if, uh, because it is the biggest breakthrough, it is the basic mechanism of aging. Do you guys know what the telomere is and what uh, uh, telomerase is? You've read that stuff? If you've been uh, reading our stuff, it would be hard not to have been exposed to it because we talk about it a lot. It turns out that you don't age by wear and tear. You age by intent, by design. It's not the environment uh, doing this to you and you're doing the best you can to fight off the environment. You have a killer inside of you. The program for aging is by design on purpose. It is evolution's uh, way of enforcing a limited lifespan so that we can get a change to occur in the gene pool. Uh, if there's no uh, death of individuals, the population can't change its genetics at the same rate. So it's carefully controlled and it's done by design. That means you can't do anything to stop it without addressing that innate, um, uh, intentional aging program. So your body, it turns out, doesn't have an absolute clock. It doesn't really know how old you are. So how does it make you so different when you are 70 than when you are two? Um, if you didn't know the aging program, you would not be able to recognize a two-year-old and a 70-year-old as even the same individual. They are so, so dramatically different. But you have the same DNA throughout your life, right? Every cell has the same DNA that you were born with until the day you die. So how? How do you go to look and behave so much differently? with exactly the same genes in every cell throughout your life? The answer is telomere biology. Your body doesn't have an absolute clock, but it has a relative clock. It counts. 
counts not days, but number of cell divisions. Every time that any of your cells divide, there's like a, a loop that goes N minus one, N minus one, a countdown to D-Day. You are only allowed so many cell divisions with every cell in your body. It has a, a senescence clock that makes the, the chromosome fold differently, interacts with epigenetic control, which genes are transcribed, to make you dramatically different according to design, on purpose, a program that you are born with. So the DNA is not like I was taught in undergraduate school. It's not really a blueprint. If it were a blueprint, how could the same blueprint make such dramatically different individuals at different stages in life? It is a program. It plays itself out with a counter. The counter is the number of cell divisions. Every time a cell divides, the terminal portion of the telomere is not copied. The shorter telomere causes the chromosome to fold differently. Different genes are transcribed in different amounts, and they make you who you are, what you are at that point in your life. So you see, you're really fighting the tide if you're trying to stop that program. It's going to win. It's, it's going to go through. It's, it's uh, program senescence until that cell has divided as many times as it can. It becomes old in behavior. It becomes weak, uh, susceptible to dysfunction and infection, and eventually will die. When enough of your cells die in a tissue, the tissue die, the organs die, uh, the, uh, the organism dies. So we have to address it to be effective with anti-aging. And we can. We now have telomerase activators that turn on the enzyme telomerase that rebuilds the telomere. So at the same time we discovered the mechanism by which you control the aging clock and tell your body how old it's supposed to be behaving at that time, we also discovered a natural clock resetter. It was, it was speculated back in 1990 when we first discovered the mechanism, which, by the way, it's amazing to me, very few doctors could describe this to you. It's like we went to the moon and no one noticed. No one is talking about it. Uh, it really is a life changer. It, it, will change, it will dramatically change the course of human evolution. We will see it in our lifetime but our children and grandchildren will live in a dramatically different world because we discovered the control mechanism for aging. And we are already intervening in a successful way. It gets better every year, and we are cracking that nut. Uh, it won't be long until we'll be able to do much more aggressive things to reset the telomere, reset your biological age, use the natural control mechanism to tell your body that it is younger. Um, so we have this inherent system. We have things that can turn on the enzyme that rebuilds the telomere. Again, we knew it must be there because think about it. If you have a child when you're 30 years old, you have already aged, your telomeres have shortened. Why doesn't your child start at 30? And then if they have a child when they're 30, that child is gonna be 60 according to your genetic clock, 90 in the next generation, any population would age itself out of existence if it's getting shortening telomere in every cell in the body. There must be a natural mechanism that stops that. The natural mechanism is an enzyme that you are born with that is switched off at inception. When there's fertilization that occurs, the, um, the clock resetter which resets the clock to zero for all egg cells and for sperm cells so that they can divide indefinitely with zero age. You can divide uh, oocytes um, for millions of times and they will never age. Their age is always zero because each time the cell divides, the telomerase is activated, rebuilds what would have been lost on the terminal portion of the telomere resets the clock for zero. Genius, right? 
incredibly sophisticated yet simple mechanism for keeping our sperm in our ova um, ageless while controlling the way all of the rest of the cells age. So we have that, um, that natural mechanism in telomerase, and now we have discovered telomerase activators. I can give you things by injection or by mouth, some um, supplements that we thought were useful for anti-aging, turns out they were working by activating the enzyme telomerase and mildly resetting a portion of the aging clock. We are becoming better and better at it. It is, um, it is a game changer in a big way. And it brings us to what we're gonna talk about uh, today because it is related to our, um, our stem cell technology. Stem cells are capable of dividing to form different kinds of cells. It turns out that in embryology, after fertilization, the clock starts ticking. But as soon as that embryo starts to divide, it sequesters a group of cells, separates them, and treats them differently, and they are separated throughout your life. Those cells become the gametocytes, the sperm cells and the egg cells. And they have telomerase turned on. That separates very early on. And then the rest of the embryo continues to develop down this path of differentiation of cells, where cells uh, make choices about what they're going to do that becomes irreversible. This cell can only do that because it is specialized to do that. And it occurs in a very sophisticated program that is, that is um, laid out in a, a sequence by the genetic code that is being translated variably like a movie. Uh, first you do this, once that's done, then you do this, and it plays out all these acts that part of the consequence of that is this differentiation of groups of cells that behave in certain ways. And then that cell has its own nucleus, but the DNA inside of there has already transformed according to the differentiation of the, the master aging program that's playing itself out. The next thing that happens is another group of cells are divided off that become stem cells. Initially, the embryonic stem cells, which we remember from the 1990s and George Bush and all that stuff, the embryonic stem cells differentiate at different rates during embryonic development and then are sent to different tissues in the embryo and in the newborn baby. So that you have lots and lots of relatively undifferentiated, that means they're capable of doing a lot more than being a brain cell or a muscle cell or a bone cell. They can still decide what they're gonna be and they can replicate indefinitely they could form a billion cells because they have telomerase. Not exactly the same as indefinite telomerase production that occurs in the gametocytes, but they have a supply of telomerase that is um, regulated differently than the other cells in your body. They go out and, and seed all of your tissue. Now, this is what we knew at the time we were trying to get these things from the embryo and it became unpopular for uh, understandable reasons that uh, there's an ethics issue. Where do those cells come from? It turns out that those cells are not very useful. All of that hullabaloo was much to do about nothing because embryonic stem cells are not so great. They can do a lot of things, but they're a little scary because they can r differentiate into anything, which means that they have the potential to form a whole new human being, which would be bad news if you, got, uh, if you got stem cells from an embryo that wasn't you, and it grew in ways that you didn't want it to, including it has immunocompetency, which means it can form white blood cells 
that then it's worse than the issue that you attack this graft that is not part of you, but also the graft can develop immune competency to attack you. So there are all kinds of issues there. Uh, someday we will sort through how to manage that, that uh, natural process of self versus non-self. But for now, we don't have to because we discovered that the stem cells that you have remain throughout your life. They decrease in aggressiveness and in population numbers, but they're still there. They're, they're not as active, but those sleeping stem cells can be brought back to life. So stem cells are tightly regulated and controlled how much they differentiate. They begin as, as pluripotent, and then they become uh, multipotent, uh, which means they can build lots of different kinds of cells, not everything, not form an entire human being, but they can uh, decide because of surrounding tissue what kind of cell they want to become and how to behave. So this concept that you have stem cells is really what I, I wanted to get to before I turn you over to um, the more practical application of stem cells for facelifts. Um, what these stem cells are and what they're capable of doing is part of the excitement that we have in using them to replace uh, facelifts. Because it is so much more natural than, than other kinds of interventions. Because it is your body's own repair kit, it's, they're, they're kind of like, like um, you are endowed with them. Um, they belong to you and they are a miracle, um, kind of God's angels that he leaves inside of you that can do anything um, and are constrained by, by the aging program and natural regulation that it's so much easier and more natural to figure out how those regulatory mechanisms are working and tweak them to use these natural instruments to rebuild. They can rebuild connective tissue. They can rebuild any tissue that you need. They can not only rebuild a muscle, but all the support structure that the muscle needs to be able to function. The, uh, the collagen, the uh, ligaments, the tendons, the nerves, the blood vessels, the uh, nourishing background, the white blood cells that are needed to defend it. All of those things can be built from stem cells. So it's so much different than where we are with surgeries and with, uh, with uh, pharmacology. Um, they leapfrog us ahead. They, they give us a tool that we can use right now that we're decades away from being able to use drugs to do. Um, because they are already inside of you, they know what to do. They miraculously, these mesenchymal stem cells, which are what we use in our facelift technology, they, um, they interact with tissue they can find tissue that's damaged, and they can repair it. Uh, the first responders are, are platelets in a tissue uh, uh, area that's damaged, but then they release these signaling uh, cytokines, uh, kind of like local hormone directors, that then cause these mesenchymal cells to come there. The mesenchymal cells can then differentiate into whatever cell is needed, but also they are kind of the second responders and traffic directors. They say, hey, we got a problem here. They send out messages through the bloodstream, through the lymphatics, and through local tissue diffusion to um, uh, announce what is going on, who they need. Uh, to come to that area to rebuild what they're determining needs to rebuild from their own assessment. 
Miraculous, right? They can go to a tissue, figure out what's wrong with it, direct the right cells and nutrients to come there, and then rebuild whatever that tissue appears to need from the kind of the intelligence um, that's, that's in the system of repair. Your body is not like a, a car. It doesn't wear out uh, from uh, um, the environment. It is different in that it is born with the capacity to replace all of its parts. And it does that beautifully well for decades. Uh, when you are young, something is damaged, uh, something's not working right, no problem. You, stem, you send stem cells there, you lay down new tissue, you rebuild that. And you know, we really never knew when I went to medical school that all that was going on. The amount of ignorance over that natural repair sy system is, is really humbling. Um, you would hear things like, well, your body replaces itself every seven years, as if this were a process that cells um, uh, wear off they're stripped away and you're just constantly uh, replacing cells at a steady rate. We didn't know that it was in this master design program that had a, a, an intelligence built into the system to know what to do at what stage in your life and that it was all controlled and in the same way that development changes the embryo that is part of the same program that changes us with aging and that we can now pick it apart and get inside of it and, and use that to our advantage. Rebuilding tissue is, has created a whole new branch of medicine called regenerative medicine, which segues a lot with anti-aging medicine, but is also used with athletes. So that's why I tell you this story. It's kind of come around full circle but now we can actually do what I dreamed about doing uh, with athletes and hormone replacement. We can use this natural system. Dr. Uh, Kaplan, who uh, discovered and named mesenchymal uh, uh, stem cells, is now suggesting that we change the name to medicinal signaling cells because it's more in line with what they actually do. They signal uh, a, a cascade of proteins, nutrients, cytokines, and cellular repair mechanisms to come to the scene and fix whatever is wrong. So they are the basic uh, building blocks. They are uh, replacement cells for anything that is uh, damaged. And it is the, the uh, breakthrough of our, our time and it will um, affect um, how we see people at different stages of life. Now that we have this kind of leapfrogged ahead in technology, it accelerates what we expect we'll be able to do. Very dramatic way. So I think facelifts are, um, are the rage right now, but it, there's a rapid transition occurring that it will be through uh, fat transfer with stem cells, uh, we can put fat there, and uh, fat is more natural than all the fillers and other uh, chemicals that are being used. The problem is that fat doesn't last, but if you put fat with stem cells, the, um, the fat will have an initial effect, and then the stem cells will replicate and produce more of the fat and connective tissue and support structures that you need to keep the fat there. So we have used them here, uh, very successful at treating diabetes, uh, heart disease. Um, there, um, there are procedures that we can use to regrow hair with stem cells. A lot in uh, male and female uh, sexual dysfunction, you can rejuvenate tissue uh, with uh, stem cells. And they're, again, completely natural. No chance that you could have an allergic reaction to stem cells. They are already part of your body. Uh, our, um, our team will talk to you more about uh, how we get them to do what we want them to do in a facelift and what uh, we've learned about doing that. Uh, you have the power to reverse um, aging. Uh, it wakes up uh, sleeping stem cells. 
uh, one of the things that we've learned recently is that some of the power of the stem cells uh, comes from the proteins that the stem cells release, that we can take those proteins alone and apply them and get uh, much of the same effect of the cell. Because remember, medicinal signaling cells, they're secreting things that, that initiates the next, the next uh, stage of repair. The cells that need to come there to repair damage and build new tissue, uh, that's occurring through these growth factors that are released from the cell. So we can take those cells, harvest, uh, stimulate them to produce their growth factors, harvest the growth factors, and use those instead of the cells for very remarkable effect. Um, so here's what they can do for your skin. Increase collagen production, decrease uh, sun damage, uh, repair or replace uh, damaged cells. That has a, a capacity to recreate the thickness uh, that we have when we're young. Uh, as we grow old, our, our epithelium becomes tissue paper thin and uh, friable, easily damaged. It can rebuild that. Uh, stimulate wound healing in a big way. As a matter of fact, we use it uh, for uh, surgical wounds nowadays. Um, so now I want to uh, transition to the practical aspect of using stem cells for facelifts. I want to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Levitt. Uh, she is anxiously waiting in the sidelines. Here's some of uh, what she brings to the picture and why she is more qualified to talk to you about this than I am. Uh, thank you for coming. I'll turn it over to Dr. Levitt. It's always very humbling to speak after Dr. Sears. <laughs> I've always been interested in food as medicine, herbs to heal people. When I uh, left medical school, that's basically what I did, was try to heal people from the inside out. And then I actually got involved with a beauty company and started learning about beauty from the inside out. How do you feed the body so that we can look beautiful and look more youthful? Of course, that led me to start, because I'm a medical doctor and I love to do procedures, I said, well, let me actually start by introducing into the face some substances that can make people look younger. But I was very much interested in doing it naturally. And the only natural substance that I knew at the time was called PRP, platelet-rich plasma. And under the supervision of Dr. Reynolds, who actually created the procedure, I learned how to do, and you may already understand that, have you heard about the vampire facial? I think Miss Kim Kardashian sort of came onto the press with blood on her face. And it was a, it was a wonder, it's a wonderful procedure where you take your own blood, and from the cells of your own blood, you can draw out platelets. And these platelets can actually heal. They stimulate growth factors that stimulate stem cells and they can create the healing effect and they can rejuvenate collagen in the face. Um, they were initially used for joints to um, help heal athletes and it was so successful that Dr. Reynolds thought, well, if we can use it for joints, why can't we put it in people's faces? And then he designed the vampire facelift. And so, but then I was doing this PRP and women or men were still saying, well, how do I get rid of this line? And so it kind of forced me to learn un less natural substances that we have, the Botox and the fillers, but I was still very much interested in figuring out a way that we can rejuvenate skin, face, tissue naturally because I love that the body is always moving towards healing. And so why can't we find the right tools to do that naturally? And then I was presented with the stem cells, you know, introducing stem cells into the tissue, introducing fat and stem cells and PRP, and all of a sudden it was magical. We can create youth naturally. It was beautiful. Um, so as we grow, as we age, our faces tend, you know, gravity is not in our favor. Our faces tend to go down. So we lose volume initially. We get wrinkles on our forehead. We start losing volume in our cheeks. And then all sorts of strange things start to happen, including wrinkles that women, men don't like. 
Um, and this was sort of just my personal journey. Um, and why I'm so fascinated with the stem cell facelift is because it can actually, these beautiful cells that Dr. Sears talked about, the stem cells, they know naturally what to do. They know that if your collagen used to be this thick and now it's thinner, they understand and they go to these areas and they say, wait a second, when you were younger it was thicker, let me do my magic and help reintroduce more collagen to this area. So the fat transfer actually started, uh, traditionally it was used for, um, well sorry, it was, we inject fat, we take fat from the body, it was originally used to, and they just put it in the face alone. But what would happen is a lot of the fat would go away just give it a few weeks and the f see the body knows where it stores fat. As you know if you've gained weight or lost weight in your history, you, it, certain areas are challenging to lose that fat in certain areas because the body knows where the fat is supposed to be. So they would introduce fat into the face but the face that didn't have fat before, the body said, what, what, it, what is it doing here? It's not supposed to be here, and it would just dissipate. Also, it requires, the fat requires a lot of blood supply in order to survive. And if you just inject the fat cells, you're not introducing new vascular flow to that area, so the fat cells don't survive. Um, so that's what would happen with the traditional fat transfer that was done. When they started to introduce stem cells, that's when the magic started to happen because the stem cells said, wait, there's fat here. I need some vascular flow. I need blood flow to help stimulate this area and let this fat last longer in the face. And so all of a sudden, it was a revolutionized uh, procedure because the fat wouldn't dissipate as much. Some of the fat will generally leave the face, but what ends up happening is then the stem cells come in and they start regenerating the tissue in the area. So the stem cell facelift, which initially is fat, stem cells, and PRP, all three are injected into the face, have multi-purposes because we get the fat cells, we get the PRP, which is the platelet-rich plasma that sends out lots of signals and stimulates our own body's natural stem cells, and then we get the stem cells which help regrow actual tissue in that area. So it's quite miraculous. Um, initially it was done for people who had uh, deformities. They would put fat in certain areas and they found it so successful and that's when it became, you know, of course anything that works and especially when it comes to facial rejuvenation, the cosmetic surgeons were like, wow, this this kind of works really nicely. Maybe we should start doing it for our patients. And that's how it became more of a cosmetic procedure. The beautiful thing, is, as I mentioned, is here we don't just do the fat. We do the stem cells and the platelets. And what happens is you get a much longer lasting effect. So your, your face can actually, we can inject your face with the stem cells, PRP, um, and the fat. And over a period of a year, these stem cells are still actively reproducing the collagen, increasing the vascular flow, bringing more um, vascularity to the area so that the fat stays there. And this procedure can actually last up to 10 years. You'll actually see over time your face, your skin, appears more youthful over time. It's quite fascinating. Um, it smooths away wrinkles, replaces lost volume. We can get to areas that you can't actually get to with filler. Certain areas are sort of dangerous if you want to put uh, hyaluronic acid in certain areas. You can only use Botox on your forehead, for example, but you can put fat basically anywhere in the face. And the beautiful part about it is you don't get the side effects that you would from Botox or hyaluronic acid. You don't get, I mean, some procedures with the fake fillers, you'll get some clumpy areas. 
puffiness, um, firm areas, even infections, depending on where you're getting your hyaluronic acid from. With fat, you're using your own body's natural substance. It's soft, it's beautiful, it's pliable. When we put it in the face, the face looks really, really full. And it's so for some people, it's like, wow, that's pretty impressive. And of course, that will eventually dissipate. What happens is over time, some of that fat will get resorbed. And then the magic of the stem cells and the PRP gets to work. And over time, the skin looks really juicier. Collagen starts to form. And this takes over years. It begins, it, it continues to work. So I love this procedure. It's it's phenomenal, and the people we've done it to have remarkable effects because we can fill in areas that you really can't with certain fillers. So the, let me talk to you a little bit about the procedure. So basically what we do is we harvest the fat from usually the abdomen or love handles, wherever we, we think that we can get the most fat from. And then we basically process it. We separate the stem cells from the fat, and then um, we reintroduce the fat, stem cells, and PRP back into the face everywhere. So the procedure takes, it's minimally invasive. It takes uh, maybe half an hour to an hour to just harvest the fat, to process it, and then putting it back in the face, because I love to do this. It's sort of an art form for me. Um, I, you know, it takes probably about two, two hours to reintroduce the fat in the face. And I can do it globally. So I can really do a complete facial, and I'll show you pictures afterwards, complete facial rejuvenation. Um, and then you go home, and there's no downtime, really. I mean, you're going to be a little bit swollen. Sometimes, not always, you'll get some bruising, but it's actually quite minimal. And it's really impressive because we go underneath the tissue in order to put the fat in. So it's not like filler. If any of you have ever had filler or Botox, bruising happens all of the time, everywhere. Um, with this procedure, and it's so much, there's so much area that we cover, and yet there's, there can be minimal bruising sometimes because we go deep in the tissue. In conjunction, uh, we have created this beauty cocktail, which we think is super beneficial because the stem cells, they're like little babies, and they need a lot of care and TLC. We want them to function to their maximum capacity. So along with the, with the facelift, the stem cell facelift, we also recommend other therapies that help the stem cells become more vital. It, it, and Dr. Sears talked about increasing the length of telomeres, which is really reviving your cellular tissue. So we have some other therapies that we recommend doing along with the facial stem, stem cell is the hyperbarics, because basically what the hyperbaric chamber will do is it infuses all the cells with oxygen. And that oxygen creates new vascular, new blood flow to the area. So the stem cells thrive in that kind of environment. The other thing is what's very important for stem cells, just like any newborn baby, is proper nutrition. So we have IV cocktails that we like to administer along with this procedure so that we make sure you get, you're getting adequate amount of vitamins and antioxidants to help those stem cells grow and survive over a long period of time. And then we have a IV laser, which we also love to use. And that's also helpful in stimulating these stem cells. What is IV laser for stem cells? So we have a laser machine that has different light waves that we actually can use locally, and we can put it in an IV. And so all your blood will pass over different this the three different light frequencies that we have and each frequency has a different function and so your whole blood system will pass over this light which has different functions one of them is going to be to uh, is anti-inflammatory which we love because when you do any type of procedure you create some inflammation and then the blood circulates everywhere in the body so it will go to your face and it will help decrease inflammation in your face so it's, uh, and we use it for many other therapies as well, but it's a beautiful therapy to use in conjunction with the stem cell facelift. 
And I already talked about uh, the hyperbaric chamber, which can aid also in the wound healing process, even though there isn't um, a lot of uh, damage done to the tissue, it still helps re you know, shorten the time where inflammation is happening and it helps heal all the areas that we have infiltrated. Uh, but more importantly, what I love about the hyperbaric is that it increases uh, the blood flow to the fat cells. And so we've had, we can actually keep more fat in the face than if you just did a fat transfer which 90% of the fat will go. But with using hyperbarics, more fat will actually stay in the face. And that's what you want, because you want volume, which is youthfulness, basically. So here are some before and after pictures. And as you can see, um, over, this is over a period of a year. And so you'll see at four months and a year, there's even more differentiation, because the skin gets more juicy looking over time, and that's because the stem cells are still doing their magic. Um, she actually maintained quite a lot of her volume. It doesn't always, she had volume to begin with, but for her it was more uh, certain areas like around the commissures of her lips that she needed a little volume, but it's mostly the skin that looks fantastic and around her eyes as well. Here's uh, somebody that I just did recently, and this is a young woman who had, you know, she didn't want to use any fillers or Botox, and so she had beautiful results. Uh, I can't really see very well, but you can see her nasal labial folds. She, had, she wouldn't use Botox, which is a typical thing that you would use over in this area. Mm -hmm. So we just filled that with fat, and we filled these areas, and I put some in her cheeks, because youthfulness actually happens a lot in the cheek area and she was very very happy and she's just uh, probably two months out so this is still a work in progress so stay tuned we'll show you pictures maybe in a year from now and see where she's at it's only going to get better and here's uh, another beautiful woman who had and she was also very pleased for her it was also mostly uh, she wanted uh, her skin to look uh, more plump and more collagen she has volume so, and she's also just four months out. So again, um, over time, you're going to see even more dramatic effects. Here's another beautiful girl. She, yeah, she looks wonderful over there. So I don't know if you, can you see the pre and post? It's pretty remarkable what, what happens to the skin. So it's not just creating volume, but it actually changes your skin. It's like using the most expensive possible face cream, which doesn't even get absorbed um, by using the PRP and the stem cells, because we can actually rejuvenate from the outside in and the inside out. Um, and here's another woman who had it, and she was very happy because she had certain areas like here which tend to be difficult to fill, and under the eyes you can't really fill a certain area because of the uh, neurological bundles, but you can do that with fat. You can fill everywhere. And then I do recommend follow-up. If you do have this procedure, it's really good, just like you're going to use a maintenance skin program, to come and have just the PRP. Uh, maybe three to four times a year. We can inject it into your face and then we can apply it to the face and do microneedling, um, which stimulates growth factors, brings more stem cells. And so this is what I consider a, a long-term plan is three times a year you would do PRP in conjunction with the stem cell facelift. And what I love about this procedure is it's natural. It's your own body's fat, stem cells, it's using, our bodies are constantly trying to heal, they're constantly regenerating, and we've just tapped into that miracle, and that's why I love this procedure, and it works, and it actually can take years off your, your face, and so fewer wrinkles, fewer sagging skin, we, we can replete lost volume, there's really little downtime, um, there's a little bruising sometimes, a little tenderness, but that's about it, and um, it's surgery-free.